Let's turn in to the Old Testament, to 1 Samuel 24, we begin reading from verse 1, and we'll read through to verse 15, 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 15. Our text this evening is verses 4 through 6 of this chapter. We read there, it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Here begins our text. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall be seen good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul, ro Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went, on the, and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, my lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see ye, see ye, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe, and kill thee not. Know thou, and see, that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. As saith the proverb of the ancients, Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea, the Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and thee and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of thine hand. And we leave the word of God there and take up those verses 4 through 6 of this passage in First Samuel. Discerning the will of God is really part and parcel of the Christian life uh, and the ability to discern God's will uh, becomes especially important when a number of different possibilities or alternatives are presented uh, to us and that occurs at times in God's providential dealings with us. It's not always that there is only one option that God presents to us in his providential dealings with us. But sometimes there are two or even more options that perhaps are presented to us. And the question arises, how are, we to achieve, how are we to choose between the different alternatives that may actually appear before us? How can we know what God really would have us to do? Or how can we determine the direction that God uh, would really have us to follow? And that's an important issue for a believer because we are repeatedly confronted by such questions. If we are those who love God, then it will be our desire uh, to live in accordance with the will of God. And so the will of God 
is important to us. We want to be obedient to God's will. We want to please him. Uh, but sometimes discerning God's will uh, can prove to be exceedingly difficult. When confronted with a number of different possibilities or alternatives, it's actually not uncommon uh, to hear Christians speaking of how that they are waiting upon the Lord. Uh, in other words, they're waiting uh, for guidance from God. And now that concept is biblical. Uh, Wait on the Lord, says David in Psalm 37. However, some who speak in those terms are referring uh, not so much to waiting on the revelation of God, but they're referring really to some mystical notion whereby they are actually looking for God to show them his will by some mysterious or miraculous means. They look to God to reveal his will by some form possibly of direct revelation. Still others seek to discern the will of God by reference uh, to his providential dealings with them. Uh, as such, they look to events and circumstances that God in his providence brings before them or opens before them. And the mere opening of a particular possibility is interpreted in that, in some instances, as a clear and unmistakable indication of the will of God. The question that arises is, is that a legitimate way of discerning the will of God? Uh, is the mere uh, presentation of a possibility or an opportunity uh, really a clear indication of the fact that that is the will of God uh, for us. Um, the reality, brethren, is this. The uh, providence of God is a very difficult book to read. It's certainly a very difficult book to read with absolute certainty. And it needs to be read with care and with spiritual sensitivity. In other words, I mean, when things are presented to us, when God and his providence bring things to pass in our lives and we're seeking direction, seeking guidance, uh, we need to be careful uh, as to how we interpret those things that God uh, sets before us. Because as I say, the book of providence uh, is in fact a difficult book uh, to read with absolute certainty and clarity. The book of providence in truth must uh, not be read in isolation. The book of providence must always be read in light of the revealed will of God. And now sometimes we're not inclined to do that. Sometimes we're inclined to just simply uh, look at what God sets before us and to make choices on the basis of what's before us. But in order to make right determination uh, we need actually to look at the uh, things that God sets before us in the light of the revealed will of God. In other words, what's revealed to us in the Bible. Uh, that's, that's where, if you want to know what the will of God is, that's where you will actually find uh, the will of God. In other words, we must not, we must not pass uncritically through every door that God in his providence actually opens before us. Uh, you might say, well, why? Why is that? Why may we not simply, if God presents something to us, why may we not simply uh, go through that door? Uh, because it may not be God's will for us to pass through that particular door. As to whether we should pass through a particular door must first be tested by the revealed will of God. In other words, a particular course of action or an opportunity that is presented to us must be checked first against the word of God. Failure to test a particular course of action or an opportunity by the revealed will of God exposes us to the danger of being seriously misled uh, as to the course that we should follow, seriously misled as to what the will of God is actually uh, for us. So I've entitled the message this afternoon, Discerning uh, the Will of God. And I want to look at it in the context of the passage here in 1 Samuel 24 concerning David uh, and Saul.
this is the background. Uh, the, the divisions I've given the sermons are these. The first are the circumstances. Secondly, the temptation. And finally, the refusal. Uh, the background to the uh, passage is this. Following uh, God's rejection of Saul as king over Israel, a rejection that came about as a result of Saul's disobedience to God, Samuel, at God's direction, had gone and anointed David to be king over Israel. David this time was, in fact, a, still a very young man at the time that he was anointed uh, to be king over Israel. The, the anointing, though, of David to be king over Israel led to increasing tension uh, between Saul and and David, and the tension became so great that David, in fact, was forced to flee from the presence of Saul uh, because on a number of occasions Saul actually had sought to kill him. Uh, David's flight from Saul, however, did not bring to an end Saul's hostility toward him. In fact, Saul's uh, hatred of David uh, seemingly increased. And Saul's hatred for David resulted in Saul uh, slaughtering anyone who rendered assistance uh, to David. You might recall how that Saul approved uh, the actions of Doag the Edomite uh, in killing the priests at Nob uh, because they had aided David and his men uh, by supplying them with food. And Saul's hatred of David uh, was also to be seen in the way in which Saul pursued David and his men uh, throughout Israel. Uh, David was at this time had a band of some 600 men with him and uh, they were being pursued uh, across uh, different parts of Israel uh, by Saul and the army of Israel. Um, it was in the wilderness, uh, if, if you, if you know, trace the, um, trace the uh, pursuit of, uh, of David by Saul, uh, you'll find they went to different places. They went to Nob, to Keilah, and then finally to the wilderness of Moan. And it was in the wilderness of Moan, just to the south of Hebron, that the human net cast by Saul began to tighten around David and his men. However, just when Saul and his forces were about to encircle David's position, news came to Saul of a Philistine incursion into Israel's territory. And so confronted by that threat from the Philistines, Saul was actually forced to abandon his pursuit of David and to engage the invading Philistines. Uh, however, having uh, been given that reprieve, we find that David, along with his 600 band of men, make their way to the strongholds of Engedi. And Engedi was a mountainous region located on the edge of the wilderness of Judah, or Judea, bordering the western shore of the Dead Sea. Uh, the area was rocky, it was an inhospitable tract of land. Indeed, the region is described there in 1 Samuel 24 and verse 3 as the rocks of the wild goats. Interestingly, numerous caves dotted the terrain around Engedi, and some of them were actually so large that they provided a hiding place for David and his uh, 600 or so men. What we find is that Having repelled the Philistines, uh, Saul uh, received word that David uh, was uh, situated at En Gedi. And that's how chapter 24 begins. Uh, it begins with the revelation uh, to Saul that David is located at En Gedi. And so he selects out some 3,000 men from all over Israel and he returns to pursuing David. And we're told that Saul came uh, to the sheep coach or to the sheepfolds by the way. Often the uh, caves were used as uh, nighttime refuges uh, for uh, shepherds and their sheep. And uh, so here comes Saul and uh, he enters into uh, one of these caves. And we're told that Saul entered into a cave uh, to cover his feet is how it's described in the King James uh, translation. Now the precise meaning of those words is somewhat obscure. Uh, some commentators suggest that the words refer simply to Saul laying down uh, to rest and that may be a possibility. 
Uh, however, perhaps the better view is that uh, the reference here is not to Saul taking physical rest or sleep, but rather that the words are employed euphemistically with reference to Saul's desire uh, to relieve himself physically. Uh, what we find here is that unbeknown to Saul, in the providence of God, the very cave into which he actually enters uh, to cover his feet uh, is in fact the very cave in which David and his men have taken refuge. And that is something that's truly amazing. It wasn't as though there was only one cave in the region of En Gedi. There, there were hundreds, if not thousands of caves in the region of En Gedi. But out of all the caves that Saul could have chosen in which to relieve himself, he chose the very cave in which David and his 600 men were hiding. And yet, here we find that uh, Saul enters that cave and he enters that cave without any uh, guard or without any uh, defence. Uh, this undoubtedly was the doing of God. Now, what, what are we seeing here? What do we see here? Perhaps we could think that here what we are seeing is that God was actually giving Saul into the hand of David. Uh, surely we see here really a providential confluence or coming together of events that actually were setting before David God's will for him in relation to Saul. It's interesting that that's exactly how uh, David's men viewed uh, what took place there at En Gedi. When they saw Saul entering into the cave alone, they concluded that God had so ordered events as to deliver Saul into David's hands. In other words, they thought that this was God's provision so as to enable David to kill Saul. And you find that in verse uh, 4. This is the first verse of our text. Behold, in other words, take note, the day of which the Lord said unto this is what the men say to David, his men say to him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Now, it's of interest uh, to note uh, that despite what the men say there in verse 4, uh, nowhere in Scripture uh, is it ever recorded that God says to David, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. In all likelihood, uh, that interpretation, that construction that uh, David's men placed upon God's providential dealings at this time uh, was one of their own creation. But nonetheless, so far as David's men were concerned, uh, what they saw in the entrance of Saul into the cave uh, by himself was a clear message from God, a clear message of God that he had delivered Saul into David's hands. And so that's why they actually say to David, Behold, today is the day. This is the day that the Lord has given to you. This is the day where you can rid yourself of Saul and when you can take your rightful place as the king of Israel. In other words, David, God through these events is plainly saying to you, It is my will that you should take the life of Saul. I suppose when you think about it, could anything be plainer? Could anything be plainer? Uh, Saul, at this point in time, was absolutely vulnerable. Here he was in the cave alone. Uh, perhaps in the cave uh, he was also indisposed in different ways. There's no one there to defend him. Uh, surely this was God delivering Saul into the hands 
of David. It's interesting to note also that David uh, had actually prayed uh, for deliverance from the oppression of Saul. You find that in Psalm 54. Uh, the heading of Psalm 54 is this, a psalm of David, when the Ziphims came and said to Saul, doth not David hide himself with us? You see, the Ziphims actually uh, betrayed David and his men and they uh, communicated to Saul his location at En Gedi. And the uh, prayer of David that's recorded in Psalm 54 is this, Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. And so, in a way, perhaps even David may have interpreted what had occurred, what occurred there at En Gedi as an answer to his own prayers for the deliverance from his oppressors. It's also interesting to consider uh, that, in a way, weight was added to the views of David's men uh, by the fact that David himself knew that it was the will of God that he should actually be the king over Israel. Uh, Samuel had already anointed him to be the king over Israel. And, and you might recall also that Jonathan's son, uh, Saul's son, uh, in fact the immediate heir to the throne of Israel, had confirmed that very thing. Uh, in First Samuel 23 and verse 17, uh, Jonathan says, Fear not, he says, speaking to David, Fear not, for the hand of, my, of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. Um, uh, furthermore, there was really no question that God had actually rejected uh, Saul. Uh, God had actually declared that to Saul uh, through Samuel. And Saul, instead of accepting uh, the determination of God, uh, that is, that he should be removed from the throne of Israel, uh, his response to that uh, determination of God was, in fact, to kill David. And uh, yet, was there any justification for his assault, his attempt to kill David? No, there's no indication in Scripture that would warrant uh, Saul's irrational hatred of David. David did not wrong Saul, uh, but in fact he served him faithfully. So seemingly all David's troubles would have been resolved if he'd taken hold of this opportunity. There'd be no more running, no more hiding, no more living out of caves. Israel would have been delivered from a godless king. Uh, David could have ascended the throne as was according to the will of God. And the will of God in that respect would have been fulfilled. When you think about it, there seem to be many reasons why it would have been appropriate for David to have seized the opportunity and to have taken the life of Saul. Now, Brother David is not the only one, though, that's confronted uh, with the coming together or the confluence of providential events, circumstances and opportunities. There are occasions in our lives when we are actually confronted by very similar things. Occasions where we are consciously seeking to know God's will for us and perhaps we've actually committed a particular matter to God in prayer and then suddenly it appears as though the answer to our problems or to our queries uh, uh, are supplied. Opportunities open up before us. Uh, God brings things across our path. And those things seem to be answers to our prayers and our concerns. And perhaps it is that everything seems to be so, so obvious as though God, in answer to our prayers, is saying, this is the way. Just as it appeared to David's men in the cave, that God was saying uh, through Saul's entrance into the cave, this is, this is what you should do. And we encounter those things also in our own lives. It seems as though through the confluence of different events, circumstances or opportunities, God actually is indicating to us his will 
He's answering our prayers uh, through the events and circumstances of our lives. Let me just illustrate that a, a little. Um, perhaps we're seeking work. Uh, we've applied for many jobs. Uh, the job market uh, is tight. We've had some uh, prospects, but none have translated into employment. Uh, the frustration grows. Uh, rejection is painful. Uh, perhaps we are responsible for a family, for the provisions that a family needs. The bills are mounting up. And then, and then we receive an offer of work. Uh, it's a good job, a well-paying job. A job that we actually would enjoy but there's a difficulty. The difficulty is the job requires work on the Lord's day. And moreover, the job is a job that could not be legitimately viewed as being a work of necessity or mercy. Well, perhaps the situation is that the work that we're offered uh, requires us to move to another locality. And the new locality is perhaps where there is no opportunity uh, to regularly worship uh, God. No true church is there. It's a spiritual wasteland. The nearest church is too far away for us to attend on a regular basis. What, what should we do? What should we do? Undoubtedly, the offer of the job uh, comes according to the province of God. Uh, we need work. We need to find work. It's good to work. Uh, we have no other offer of work. Clearly a door of opportunity is open uh, to us. But the question is, is it a door that we should walk through? Is God, by virtue of these providential circumstances in the provision of these jobs, actually saying to us, take the job, take the job? Should we take uh, the job that requires us to work on the Lord's day, but which does not involve a work of necessity or mercy? Should we uh, relocate to take a job that prevents us from regular attendance upon the worship of God? How are we to determine that? How are we to understand what the will of God is? What, what is to be our guide? Is the will of God to be determined simply by the opportunity that is presented to us. And I suppose relating it back to David's situation, was David to determine the will of God so far as he was concerned simply by the opportunity that was presented to him by Saul's entrance into the cave that day. There was force, of course, in what uh, David's men urged upon him. And David could feel the force of their argument. It was true that everything seemed to be falling into place and it appeared even perhaps to have borne the approval or authorization of God. Clearly it was the providence of God that brought Saul into the cave. Saul could have gone into any other cave, but he didn't do that. He entered into the very cave in which David and his men uh, were hiding. Opportunity, justice and the will of God appeared to coalesce or come together. Notice in response to the urging of his men, we are told in verse 4, Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. In other words, David rises up from his hiding place in the cave and he moves to a place near to where Saul was positioned and he cuts off the skirt or the bottom or the corner of Saul's robe privily or stealthily. Now, we're not told exactly how that occurred. Uh, it's possible that Saul at that time had actually removed uh, his outer robe so it was not actually 
physically on his body. Uh, nonetheless, uh, David, uh, we're told, cuts off the skirt uh, of Saul's robe stealthily. What we do know is that David, having cut off the skirt of Saul's robe, was smitten or struck in his conscience. It did not hurt Saul in any way, yet David's conscience was troubled and disturbed by what he did. And the question arises, why? Why was David disturbed uh, by his uh, cutting off of the uh, skirt of Saul's robe? The reason appears to be that David seriously contemplated doing what his men urged him to do. After all, what they had encouraged him to do seemed to make sense. But David, when he came near to Saul, could not bring himself to kill Saul. Instead, he simply cut off a piece of his robe to demonstrate what he might have done. But interestingly, even the cutting off of the skirt of Saul's robe troubled David's conscience. Saul, after all, this is reflected in what is said in this uh, in our text and in the chapter generally, Saul, after all, was the king of Israel. Uh, he was the anointed of God. Uh, he was king according to the will of of God. And G David was duty bound to be subject to him. David's calling was to honour and uphold the king. And by cutting off a piece of Saul's robe, uh, David really provides us with a window into his own heart. You see, there was a natural carnal desire within David to get rid of Saul. It was the natural man within David that entertained the cor this course of action. Uh, it certainly, however, was not the mind of God himself. It was not according to the spirit of God that David should kill Saul. And we know that because uh, we find that uh, beginning in verse 6, we read this, The Lord forbid, the Lord forbid, that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. And so David there in, that, in verse 6 really reveals uh, what the will of God actually was. It was not the will of God that he should take the life of uh, Saul. And he gives the reasons why that he ought not take the life of Saul either. Uh, he calls Saul his master. He describes him as the Lord's anointed and he recognises for him to stretch forth his hand against him uh, was in fact for him to touch the anointed of the Lord. Uh, now clearly the coming together of all these events that day uh, there in the cave uh, was not an indicator uh, of the will of God. That is, the coming of these events together and the opportunity that are presented uh, to David to take the life of Saul uh, should not have been interpreted uh, as being an invitation to David to take the life of Saul. God did not bring these things uh, together for that purpose. At times when there is a confluence of events and circumstances and opportunities, uh, there is a tendency for our old nature to seize upon those things and to seek to convince us that the opportunity presented must accord with the will of God. However, what is actually occurring uh, is that our remaining corruption is actually seeking to gain the ascendancy in our lives and seeking to lead us in a very different direction from the one that God would actually have us to follow confluence of events and circumstances and opportunities uh, 
affords the simple inclinations of our hearts an opportunity to express themselves. In other words, though we say that we desire to know what God's will for us is, our remaining corruption really feeds our desire to actually pursue our own will at the expense of the will of God. The confluence of events, circumstances and opportunity provide us with the opportunity to pursue our own desires, our own sinful desires, and we do so under the guise of pursuing God's will. Now, old man of sin seizes the opportunity. He seizes the opportunity with alacrity, and we are easily convinced that we are doing the will of God. But what in truth we have done is simply to give expression to our remaining corruption and the desires of our old man of sin. Go back to the example of the offers of work. Can it be concluded that the offers of work in and of themselves actually reflected the will of God? So the offers of work are there. Uh, Would it be right simply just to say, well, the offer of work is there. I need work. God provided the opportunity, ipso facto, I ought to take that work. Is that how we are to deal with God's providential dealings with us? Is it, is it the will of God that a believer should work on the Lord's day? Is it the will of God that a believer should actually not attend the public worship of God? And brethren, we may persuade ourselves uh, that because these things are presented to us, because of our needs, that it's legitimate for us to actually undertake such work. But the question remains, is that truly the will of God for us? It's the same question in a way that David was confronted with. Uh, there was the opportunity to take the life of Saul, but was it truly the will of God that he should actually do so, notwithstanding uh, all of the apparent benefits that would actually have flowed uh, from his taking of the life of Saul? David refused, of course, to take uh, the life of Saul, notwithstanding that there was a strong motivation for him to do so, So the question arises, how was, that, was David, actually, David able to actually discern the will of God there in the cave at En Gedi? And likewise, how can we rightly discern the will of God in our own lives? How can we determine whether it's right or wrong uh, to accept the uh, jobs in the circumstances that have been set forth? That's what David says to his men. He says, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. Now what does that mean? The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. Does that mean that God somehow or other appeared uh, to David as he contemplated taking the life of Saul and actually reveal to him that they should not actually do that. Uh, there's no indication of uh, such a revelation of God to David there in the cave at En Gedi. And did you know there was no need, there was no need for God to provide such a revelation to David. You see, David knew all along that he should not take the life of Saul. He knew that Saul had been appointed by God. He knew that God had called Saul to the office of king. And though Saul had been rejected by God, David held no mandate from God to remove Saul from office, let alone to take 
is life. You see, David knew the will of God in this matter. God's will, in fact, was clearly stated in the law of God. What was the law of God uh, concerning the taking of the life of another? The law of God given to the children of Israel at Sinai was this, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. And David was bound by that law. The sixth commandment of the law of God declared to David the will of God, just as the commandments today declare to us the will of God. So it here was that the sixth commandment of God's law declared God's will uh, to David. He, he wasn't ignorant of the will of God. And that's why David says, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing under my master. He knew uh, the will of God. He knew that God forbade him to take the life of Saul. And so fearing God, David spared the life of Saul despite the obvious benefits of taking his life. If David had killed Saul, uh, he would have manifested his carnal ambitions for the throne. And that would have indicated that he was no more fit to sit upon the throne of Israel than was Saul. God would, in his appointed time, give David the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom was not his, however, to snatch by force from Saul. God would remove Saul. And God, in fact, did remove Saul shortly thereafter through the instrumentality of the Philistines. But if David had killed Saul, he would have been unfit to rule over the people of God. Brethren, we need to be exceedingly careful as to how we interpret the events of providence and what conclusions we actually draw from them. We must never attempt to interpret providential events in isolation from the revealed will of God. In other words, to put it another way, we must never in attempt to interpret providential events apart from the Bible. Providential events must always be considered in the light of the revealed will of God. Only then can the will of God in each instance be rightly discerned. What do you think? What do you think about the jobs? What does the word of God say about taking the job where we are required to work on the Lord's Day? What's the word of God say about taking the job that sees us unable uh, to attend upon the public worship of God on a regular basis? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in that thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. There's the answer. There's the answer. That's the will of God. The will of God is that we honour the Sabbath day. Or perhaps we could uh, refer to Hebrews 10, 24, 25, where the writer of Hebrews says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto, unto love and to good works, Notice this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Is it, is it important? Is it the will of God that we should attend upon the public worship of God on the Lord's Day? Yes, it is. 
But then there, there's the answer. There's the answer to the question of whether we should take the work on the Lord's Day or whether we should take the work that takes us away from the public worship of God. What, what was the answer for David uh, despite the urgings of his men? The answer for David is, thou shalt not kill. But then let, let us uh, always read uh, the book of Providence in the light of the revealed will of God. Amen.